One of my favourite releases for Bulge British is a plastic challenger, basically an extended Cromwell armed with a 17-pounder gun. Like the Sherman Firefly, Challenger was a stopgap design, an attempt to get a 17-pounder armed tank into action quickly. Both these vehicles filled a vital role in the early days of the Northwest Europe campaign. Join me as we take a look at Battlefront's plastic 15mm Challenger kit. This is BBX-72, the Challenger Armoured Troop box set for British forces in Flames of War. The box gives you four vehicles, enough for a full troop. I have a couple of the resin versions of this vehicle from the previous edition, but I'm very keen to see what these are like in plastic. You also get some plastic challenges in the very good value Comet Armoured Squadron starter box set which is where my review example came from. For most of the war, Britain lagged behind in getting better anti-tank guns into service. While both excellent weapons in their day, both the two-pounder and the six-pounder gun stayed in service as tank armament long after they were outclassed by increases in tank armour. It's not like Britain didn't have capable anti-tank guns. The 17-pounder anti-tank gun was an excellent weapon, and developments in ammunition helped it keep pace with ever heavier German armour. However, it was a big gun, not too much of a disadvantage in a wheeled gun carriage, but it proved difficult to fit into a tank turret. Vickers' attempt to develop a high-velocity 75mm gun for Cromwell failed. While this design would eventually lead to the 77mm gun of Comet, Cromwell entered service with the six-pounder gun modified to fire 75mm ammunition. This left Britain with an immediate hard-hitting tank shortfall. Challenger was developed as an expedient stopgap. It used a lengthened Cromwell chassis and mounted a 17-pounder gun in a tall, slab-sided turret. The Challenger's turret was four inches wider than Cromwell's, but the hull was no wider. This meant it couldn't be mounted using a conventional turret ring, and was instead attached to a bearing system directly on the hull floor. The added weight of the gun and turret was offset by the lengthened hull and reduced armour protection. The hull machine gun was removed to increase ammunition stowage, and an extra loader was added to the crew to handle the larger, heavier rounds. The crew was five men, the driver in the hull, gunner, commander and two loaders in the turret. While it had good firepower and was fast enough to keep up with Cromwell's, Challenger had a high silhouette and was lightly armoured. While ready in time for D-Day, Challenger lacked any capability for deep wading. They didn't arrive in theatre in France until July and August when they could be landed via Mulberry Harbours. This meant Sherman Fireflies, Sherman's modified with the 17-pounder gun, provided British tank squadrons their heavy anti-tank fire support early in the campaign. The 17-pounder armed tanks were always in short supply. Both Challenger and Firefly were usually fielded one per troop, with the rest of the troop's tanks being standard Sherman's or Cromwell's. The 17-pounder equipped tanks were expected to deal with any heavy armoured threats the troop encountered. Initially fielded by the Guards Armoured Division and 11th Armoured Division, Challengers later joined the Cromwell units of the 7th Armoured Division. They were often fielded alongside Cromwells in the division's armoured reconnaissance regiments, because they could match the Cromwells' speed. 200 Challengers were built in total. In the end, it proved cheaper to modify Sherman's into Firefly configuration, and by 1945, Cromwell, Challenger and Firefly were all being replaced with the A-34 Comet with the very effective 77mm high-velocity gun. If we look at the back of the box, there's an image of a completed kit and an exploded assembly diagram. The image gives you a good look at the big, boxy turret of this tank. There are a few parts to this kit, but the build looks pretty straightforward. Some of the parts here are optional. 
The box contains parts to build four tanks and includes a decal sheet. You also get a sprue of hard plastic British Tech Commander figures not mentioned on the box. Let's look at the plastic. The parts come on a single sprue with two frames, moulded in green plastic, and the parts are well cast with nice sharp detail, the sort of quality Battlefront consistently produce in their 15mm plastic range. The engineering also looks pretty solid, another usual Battlefront hallmark. If we look at this frame, there's the upper and lower hull pieces, the mantlet, gun, exhaust cowl, open commander's hatch and some stowage. The upper hull has lots of nice engine deck and grille detail, as well as hatches and headlights. Plenty of details to catch with a dry brush during painting. Note the curved plate in front of the turret. Because the turret is supported on a bearing in the hull rather than set down into a turret ring, there's a slight gap where the hull and turret meet. This curved plate on the hull prevents bullet splash or shrapnel entering the fighting compartment. As with the Cromwell kit, the fenders are moulded integral with the upper hull piece. The lower hull piece shows the differential keying for the tracks. You won't be able to assemble this the wrong way. Not without considerable effort anyway. This is the gun mantlet. On the first 40 production challenges this casting was only 40mm thick to save weight, but subsequently a 102mm casting was used. That's a big jump in protection. The mantlet piece has the searchlight moulded integral with it, one of those nice engineering touches that makes this part more secure. There's a slit for the sight, plus another for the coaxial Beza machine gun. You can see the mounting hole for the main gun is keyed. Speaking of the main gun, here it is. This is the Ordnance quick-firing 17-pounder gun, a powerful late-war 3-inch anti-tank gun. It's a long weapon fitted with a muzzle brake, and this gave Challenger its punch. The rest of the parts on this frame include the exhaust cowl, which fits onto the engine deck to deflect the engine exhaust downwards. This is an optional part. Many challengers didn't have it fitted. There's also the open commander's hatch, a spare road wheel, and a stowage box. This next frame has the one-piece tracks, the upper and lower turret parts, front and rear hull plates, turret peg, closed commander's hatch, and a tarpaulin. The slab-sided nature of the challenger turret makes it easy to mould. The upper turret part is one piece, with just a separate insert part for the rear turret door. It was pointed out to me by a viewer that these doors, like the one on the King Tiger, are primarily designed to allow easy access to the gun and breech, but they're also useful for crew egress or reloading ammunition. The upper turret has vents and sights, as well as a closed square loader's hatch and a hole to mount the commander's hatch. The closed commander's hatch is right here on the sprue. Tracks are one-piece parts, keyed on the back so they only go on one way. There's plenty of good bolt detail on the road wheels. While the tracks are similar to Cromwell, note the extra road wheel of the lengthened hull. Early production challenges were notorious for throwing tracks. The problem turned out to be the use of smaller idler wheels. Replacing these with standard Cromwell idlers solved the issue. Track detail is pretty simple but good enough for a wargaming kit. There's a couple of minor sink marks on these parts, but they should be hidden against the hull on the assembled vehicle. The lower turret piece shows the odd shape of this large turret. This piece fits up inside the upper turret piece, located by a ridge to get the positioning right. There's a chamfer on this part, but it seems to angle the wrong way. If you use it to minimise the join, the turret peg ends up the wrong way up. The front hull plate has the round driver's hatch but no hull machine gun. Not even a plated overfitting, just a blank piece of armour plate. The rear hull plate looks very much like the Cromwell. A research source identifies the prominent box as a first aid kit, and the other square fittings lower down are smoke dischargers. That just leaves the tarpaulin which the assembly diagram shows being fitted on the engine deck, and the turret peg. 
I noted with interest that the date of this kit is 2021, despite Bulge British being a late 2022 release. I think that indicates just how much COVID and the disruption it caused had disrupted Battlefront's release schedule. This is a nice kit. It's thoughtfully engineered, with a reasonably low parts count. There's enough detail for a 15mm wargaming miniature to end up with a nice looking tank on the table. There's even some extra stowage. I'm not sure what else you could ask for. This is another solid miniature from Battlefront. So how will Challenger work on the table? Let's look at the unit card for the Hussars Armoured Troop. Challenger is a tank unit. Motivation is a confident 4+, plus, but with a 3 plus remount for protected ammo. This means bailed crews are more likely to get back in the tank. Skill is a trained 4+. Plus. By this stage of the war, British losses from D-Day and France have been made good, and the replacements have been trained and integrated into units. They are careful, hit on a 4+. Plus. Armour is the same as Cromwell, with a 6 front, 4 side and top 1. While Challenger has a big gun, armour protection is light to keep the weight down, in marked contrast to German tank design philosophy of the time. Tactical move is 12 inches or 30 centimetres. It can keep pace with the nimble Cromwell, unlike the slower Sherman Firefly. However, Challenger's mobility is worse with a 4 plus cross. Keep these away from terrain obstacles if possible. The main gun is the 17 pounder with late war ammunition. This has a 36 inch or 90 centimetre range with a halted rate of fire of 2 and moving of 1. I miss the version 3 rule that gave Challenger a halted rate of fire of 3 because of the extra loader, but slow rate of fire was a legitimate complaint about the real tank, so it makes sense to remove that rule. It's a pity, because the V3 combination of rate of fire 3 and the semi-indirect fire rule which lets you re-roll misses made Challenger kick serious late war ass. Anti-tank is 15. Up from D-Day 17 pounders 14 because of improved ammunition, but still not enough to slug it out toe-to-toe -to -toe with a King Tiger. Use Challenger's speed to flank for side shots. Firepower is 3 plus. The 17 pounder is an anti-tank weapon, so it gets the no HE rule which adds plus one when firing at infantry. The coaxial machine gun has rate of fire 3 moving and halted, AT2 and 6 firepower. At this stage of the war, British get access to Challenger, Firefly and Comet. They're all very similar. Challenger and Firefly get one more point of anti-tank penetration over Comet's 77mm gun, but have slightly less armour. Challenger beats Firefly with slightly better speed. And in the bulge period, you get options to field pairs or even full troops of these, not just one heavy tank per troop. While waiting to transition over to Comet, the 15th 19th King's Royal Hussars collected their remaining challenges in best condition and formed them into separate troops. The Hussars Armoured Squadron lets you take up to two troops of three or four challenges, one of them compulsory. Three tanks are 21 points and four is 28. That's seven points apiece, the same cost as Comet and Firefly. You can also still field mixed Cromwell and Challenger troops in the Cromwell Armoured Squadron. Each armoured troop can take a mix of Cromwell tanks and up to two Firefly or Challengers. This reflects the composition of troops in most armoured reconnaissance regiments of tank brigades in late 44 and early 1945. So that's Battlefront's plastic Challenger kit for Flames of War. It builds up into a nice kit with easy assembly and solid engineering here, easily up to Battlefront's outstanding quality for plastic wargaming kits. Despite both Challenger and Firefly being expedient designs, they do the job. They get a heavy gun into British tank units, but maintain their mobility, unlike the German philosophy of matching a heavy gun with heavy armour. Challenger, Firefly and even Comet are glass cannons. They hit hard, but you're going to take losses. But they are starting in the bulge period to be available in sufficient numbers to get the job done. Not the ideal tools, but adequate ones. And not every German tank is a King Tiger.
and at seven points each, you can afford to have enough of them to get a win. I do miss the old rate of fire 3 and semi-indirect fire rules from V3, but honestly, this version 4 interpretation is a more accurate representation of what Challenger was. A stopgap expedient designed to get the 17-pounder into the hands of British tankers quickly until something better could be designed. And having the standard Cromwell squadron and the unique Hussars formation means you can field these in more than one way. It's nice for British players to have a range of options. I hope this review was helpful. If you're enjoying Fog of War content, please take a moment to like and subscribe or leave a comment. Thanks for watching. See you next time.